I'm not here to really talk too much. I'm here to listen to uh, Andrew's uh, wonderful uh, speech. I've been told he'll be contributing towards the social responsibility and all the other involvement. It's certainly a pleasure to be here and speak about what I think is an exciting time for the college. Um, I think what we're doing around social responsibility is, is cutting edge, it's leading. Well, thank you very much for the introduction. And um, I'm really honoured to be here uh, to, to talk to you today. And I, I've never had expectations set so high of a, of a talk that I'm going to give by my esteemed colleagues here. So I hope I, I, hope I won't disappoint. Um, I also suspect that my laptop is going to interrupt me halfway through with one of those little squares. So if you forgive me in future on that one, I may have to quickly click something off on the mouse. Anyway, um, before, I, before I start, let me just tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I am, as, as was said in the introduction, I, this is my 26th year at Procter & Gamble. Um, I joined the company when I was very young. Um, and uh, I, I, having studied at Birmingham University, uh, I'm a chemical engineer by, by training, and I joined Procter & Gamble thinking that I would be a scientist for the rest of my life and that I wanted to make things and build things. So I joined Procter & Gamble in Newcastle, where we have one of our technical centres, as a chemical engineer, and very quickly got into what was called technical brand management, which turned out to be taking the lumps out of boxes of washing powder. That was my first job. Um, in 1988, uh, P&G became more centralised in research and development, and they asked me to move to Brussels in Belgium um, to work in their European research and development organisation. Uh, and I then met my wife and, uh, and got married and had children. And in fact, even today, I still live in Brussels. Um, so during the weekends, I'm a father and a, and a husband, and during the week, I jump on the plane or the train, I come here, and I work for Procter & Gamble in the UK. Uh, I'm a long way from being a scientist at the moment, um, and that's one of the great things about P&G, is it does offer you opportunities to change careers, and just by sheer serendipity, I moved from research and development into financial management in the mid-90s, managing the European R&D budget for Procter & Gamble, which was very interesting. Uh, and I discovered one very important rule in multinational companies, which is he who understands the budget has the most power. Um, and, um, and then in the 2000, when the company again restructured, going from regional to global operations, um, the, the job that I had was sort of uh, didn't look very promising from a career point of view. And at that time, I was, I was told, yeah, you, Andy, you can make PowerPoint presentations, can't you? I said, yeah. And uh, you can write speeches. I said, yeah, thinking I've never written a speech in my life. And they said, well, we, yeah, we think we have a job for you in external relations. Um, we have a position, and you seem to have the right skills. And that's how I moved into the external relations function of Procter & Gamble. And uh, this is now my third assignment in external relations. I started doing corporate communications, so speech writing for RP bosses. I then went on to being the uh, regional leader for our Western European fabric care business, which is laundry detergents. Um, and now I am in charge of all of our external communications for the UK and Ireland, which I have to say is a lot of fun. And it gets me out and about a bit, and I meet interesting people like Saad, uh, who then invite me to come and talk. So that's how I got here today. Um, and what Saad asked me to talk about really is a little bit just about Procter and & Gamble and how we embed what we call sustainability. So corporate social responsibility, sustainability, these are all words for pretty much the same thing. But in PG we call it sustainability. And I just wanted to paraphrase what I'll, I'll talk about in more detail with, with a couple of sorts of key points at the beginning. The first one is that, um, and I'm sure it, I don't need to tell you this, but in a, com in, in a multinational company like Procter & Gamble, just out, in, incidentally, how, much, how many of you have heard of Procter & Gamble before um, I was introduced? Okay, so not so many of you, which is not surprising because as you probably have heard of Gillette, right? And Ariel and Pampers, and we are a company of brands, so we have many brands. Um, we are very well known for the brands that we make, not so well known for who we are. And we are actually trying to change this at the moment. Um, so I don't, some of you may have seen television advertising in the last um, year talking about proud sponsors of Mums, which is um, how we are really positioning ourselves as a, as a company, because all of our products, most of our products are bought by, by mothers. And so we've realized that this is one of the unique things about our company, is that we are very much connected with Mums. 
And so we have been talking about ourselves a lot more, and that's been triggered by the fact that um, we are now one of the Global Olympic sponsors, uh, which is why I'm wearing this little badge here on my, on my left side. And because we realize that if we are an Olympic sponsor, people are going to know who we are. So we have actually started to go out there and talk about us as a company. Um, I want to find out uh, who is directly responsible, who directly drives the corporate social responsibility of P&G, and uh, uh, if they have any incentives from the government. And my question is, how do Procter & Gamble measure input of corporate and strategy as a corporate social responsibility work? Um, I would like to know how Procter & Gamble uses best practice between the UK and its overseas operation. Mm -hmm. What's the difference between uh, corporate social responsibility and business ethics? Well, I'll just take them in the order uh, of him. So the first question is, who drives sustainability? Sorry, so who drives sustainability within P&G? Well, I think it's it, the direction and the sponsorship of sustainability within P&G is with our CEO. So that's a guy called Bob McDonald. And I think that one of the problems that we had in the past was up until about 2000, 2001, the CEO of P&G really saw sustainability as a sort of, you know, something you had to do, but it wasn't really important. And then in 2000, we changed CEOs, and a guy called A.G. Lapley took over. Um, and A.G. was um, CEO until about 2009, I think. And he actually got it. And under him, he changed the structure, um, whereas our sustainability department was this little corporate department that was... In fact, not our sustainability directors based here in the UK, um, the global one. And um, they were really working hard, but no one was really listening to them at the senior level. And AG changed that. And he put a direct reporting line of that group up through to him. And suddenly, they had a voice. And that was when things started to really get integrated. Because if it's not integrated into the innovation process, as I said earlier, if it's not being thought about from the beginning, from before, you know, from when your product upgrade is a something on a piece of paper, it's not going to happen. So, it's it has to be led from the top, and um, you know, it would. It's I have to recognise one of our competitors, um, Unilever. I don't know if um, any of you read the papers or see anything, but Unilever, um, who are one of the other major consumer goods manufacturers, their CEO is a guy called Paul Polman. Paul was the Western European president for P&G when I was doing my first external relations job. He was a great guy. And um, he, since joining Unilever, he has really taken sustainability so seriously that it's fully embedded into their business strategy, I would say, frankly, quietly, even better than us. And, um, and he is, you know, he's out there talking about it. So you, you know, if, you, if you were to Google Unilever and sustainability and P&G sustainability, it would be very, you know, it's a great subject for a thesis. If you, if you have a thesis that you need to do, look at how the major consumer goods companies are looking at sustainability. You will see, you know, different approaches and I would say best in class at the moment is Unilever. Uh, second question, how do we measure? Well, you saw in some of the slides that I had that we, we have set ourselves goals so we set, we set, in 2002, we set ourselves a set of 2012 goals. And in 2007, we realized that we'd met them all and we realized we hadn't been ambitious enough. So in 2007, we reset our 2012 goals and they're the ones that we will actually report on in September. We then set these long-term visions and in between what we've, what we've done is we've set decade goals. So we've set a set of goals for 2020. I didn't go into detail on those, but they are, they're sort of our first milestone on that journey, on that long 30, 40 year journey. So we will set, so we set those times for 2020, and then I think we will obviously we'll set them probably for 2030 and then 2040. So really long term measures. Um, on overseas, one of the things about PG, one of the wonderful things about PG, and I think it probably goes for many other multinational companies, is 
mobility of employees. So when you join a company like P&G, frankly, if you, if you have ambitions to be a very, very senior manager in P&G, and that's much more senior than I am, um, vice presidential or general, what we call general management levels, that's the level of the chief exec within P&G in the UK, and there are a number of levels higher than that, um, you have to be mobile. You have to be willing to go where the company is going to send you. And, um, and but one of the advantages of that is that people bring best practices with them. So they will, so you'll have a, a young guy from Pakistan who started his career with PG in Pakistan. And he's transferred to Geneva to work for the, um, for the whole sort of regional um, Middle East and African organization. And he will say, well, you know, when I was in Pakistan, I was, you know, we worked on this program on, um, on aerial and it was really great, you know, how can we reapply this to the other countries? And it's through that kind of sharing that um, many things become global. We, 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 we're, we're quite good, and I would, I would only say quite good, we're not brilliant at sharing best practices, but we do do it. So, and there are some great examples. Hello, oh, I'm back again. There are some great examples of um, the UNICEF uh, collaboration started in Belgium. It was a tiny little collaboration with the Belgian office of UNICEF, and it was so successful that it was immediately scaled up at the Western European level, and then it was so successful at the Western European level that it was immediately scaled up to the global level. So that's how things travel. When things work, they tend to get they tend to get noticed. And then on the final point, on ethics, um, I, one of the things that we have in place, I'm sure it's the, it's the same, I would hope it's the same for most multinationals. We have a very, very strong, um, as I said, we have a purpose, but beyond that purpose, we have an extremely strong ethical um, sort of responsibility of employees. So every employee has to understand um, what something called the Worldwide Business Conduct Manual, and this covers everything. It covers it covers the way you behave in the workplace. It, it covers the way you treat your fellow employees. It covers the way you treat outside parties. It covers bribery. It covers um, you know you know accepting giving gifts. It covers everything. And any employee that does not meet the standards of that, of those, um, of the fact that ethical side, um, will will not last very long in the company. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.